Today I would like to talk about Mycenaean Greece. This was the first civilization to emerge in Greece and it is the direct ancestor of the later classical Greek civilization that people are much more familiar with. So without any further ado, let's look into the earliest chapter of Greek history. Scholars didn't even know that the Mycenaean civilization had existed until the mid-19th century when German businessman turned archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann discovered the site at Mycenae. I think he based it on a passage in Thucydides where um, the Argives were wont to visit a local site called Mycenae where there were some old ruins. And he went to that site in Greece and he dug it up and revealed that there was a great palace there. And because he excavated this uh, site at Mycenae, he named an entire civilization the Mycenaeans. Um, he also excavated the city of his Sarlik in uh, Turkey, and that is what he believed to be the site of Troy, and almost everyone agrees with him that his Sarlik and Troy must be one and the same. Um, so where did Schliemann come from? Well, as I mentioned, he's a German businessman, and he actually was mostly making his money as a military contractor. Uh, one of the bigger fortunes that he made was during the Crimean War of 1854 and 1856 when England and France fought against the Russians. He was able to retire in 1858 and after that point he devoted himself to scholarship and to archaeology. And it would be at this point in the middle of his life when he really started to read heavily and get interested in classical studies. So that it was at that point that he decided to use his wealth to do archaeology, which was an up-and-coming field where a lot of the parameters of how you should actually excavate a site were not well established. So in many ways, Schliemann was an on-the-job learning experience. Um, and a lot of the things that he did ended up being good, and a lot of things that he did ended up being pretty questionable. Um, here you see his mistress, who was a much younger Greek woman. Um, one of the things that he did when he was at Hisarlik is that he allowed her to wear some of the jewelry that they uncovered from some of the various layers at Troy. And apparently she probably took that jewelry with her. And uh, so it's been lost to scholars. Um, I won't go into detail on a lot of the questionable practices that Schliemann had, but as you can imagine, when archaeology was in its infancy, it was hard to dig things up without doing damage and to really make good distinctions between different layers of archaeological findings. But, to his credit, he did um, put his fortune where his mouth was, and he did find a couple of major sites which really increased our knowledge of the ancient past. So just to fully contextualize the Mycenaean civilization, what we're talking about is Bronze Age Greece, and as I'll show later, we know for a fact that these people are in fact Greek. Um, this Mycenaean Age lasts from about 1600 to 1100 BCE, so this is one of the later Bronze Age civilizations to emerge, and it is firmly located within the Late Bronze Age. Um, there is really not much to speak of before that except for scattered remains of uh, what we might call pre-civilization. Um, there was a large Late Bronze Age trade network and an international system of diplomacy, and the Mycenaeans were the westernmost and newest of the members of that network. The Hittites were aware of the Mycenaeans, and they referred to them as the Ahiyawa, some people have proposed that that word is related to the Greek term Achaeans, but again, uh, that is based on some linguistic guesswork, so who's to say, really? Um, and if Homer is to be trusted, the Greeks themselves during this period um, had not adopted their current name, the Hellenes, which they had come to by the Archaic period, but rather they, started, they were referring to themselves variously as the Danans, the Achaeans, that was the main one that she was in Homer, and the Argives, which you might think is a little too specific for the city of Argos, but it looks like the term was used more broadly at an earlier period. So, anyway, um, they did not call themselves the Mycenaeans, as you might guess, despite uh, Schliemann's findings at Mycenae. 
but I'll refer to them as the Mycenaeans for the sake of ease and clarity. So what are sources of information about Mycenaean Greece? Well, as I mentioned above, Schliemann basically inaugurated the modern archaeological investigation of Greece, and that has proceeded apace. We've learned a great deal since Schliemann, so that is a major source. One thing that people like to use as a kind of guide to the Mycenaean world are Homer's epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which seem to refer to the distant past, which at the time for Homer would have been the Mycenaean Age. However, the Iliad and the Odyssey, if we look at just the weapons descriptions that they give, they refer to weapons from the Dark Ages and the Mycenaean Age, and even some from fairly deep in the Mycenaean Age, well before the supposed date of the Trojan War. So it looks like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are very long traditions kept by bards which had evolved over time and had lots of scattered elements from lots of different time periods. And scholars have really debated heavily as to which pieces represent uh, a Mycenaean origin and which pieces are more Dark Age origin. Um, and also how reliable any of these sort of distant memories of the Mycenaean Age are in the first place. Um, that's not something I'll get into too much. There is a whole host of scholarly literature on the subject, though, that you can find if you have access to something like JSTOR. Um, so we also have a classical Greek writers, people like Thucydides. Now, Thucydides um, was not aware of there being, say, a Mycenaean civilization in the Bronze Age, and then there being a period of discontinuity, a Dark Age, and then you know a reinvigoration um, of the Greek civilization. He just saw it as one continuous development from the time of the heroes and the age of mythology to his own time. Um, so what we can get out of Thucydides and other, other authors is of somewhat limited value. Um, they also seem to underestimate the amount of time that had passed since the Trojan War. So um, again, it's kind of Worth, it's worth looking at these sources to see if we can find some diff, distant memories of the Mycenaean past, but really disentangling that from their own concerns in their present can be pretty difficult, if not outright impossible at times. Our other great source, though, are we have these Linear B tablets. And unlike Linear A that the Minoans had, we know for a fact that Linear B was a pictographic form of the Greek language. We've been able to decipher it and read it. So we've learned quite a bit of stuff from those tablets. Let's take a look at how that deciphering happened. So Linear B, like many pictographic systems and like cuneiform in the Near East, was inscribed on clay tablets and scholars have managed to completely decipher it because they figured out at a certain point that it is the same language as Greek, just in a earlier version, so some of the words are a little different. But um, the basics are the same and the grammar is the same. So um, they've worked it out to such a degree that a scholar could look at a linear B tablet that was just dug up at a new site and they could tell you whether they were talking about a horse, a mare, or a stallion. Now these tablets have been invaluable, but a lot of what they've revealed is more about trade details and the um, details of the production of agriculture. Um, there have been references to gods and to military preparations and a few other things, but for the most part uh, these tablets are sort of everyday economic in their content. Um, and they sort of just detail the finances and doings of the palace. So a lot of what we have isn't super interesting, I guess you could say and it doesn't really do a lot to illuminate the mindset of the Mycenaean Greeks. So by looking at pottery sherds and their evolution and then by looking at Mycenaean findings in other lands and using the more established chronology of civilizations in the Near East and Egypt, we've been able to establish a chronology for Mycenaean civilization. Now, as I mentioned earlier, they have a relatively late emergence of Bronze Age culture, um, and that leads to the earliest manifestation of the Mycenaean civilization, which is the Shaft Grave era. Um, this is a Shaft Grave here, 
Um, and those were burials for warriors for the most part. These occur for about 150 years. And then we have the Koine era, which is basically when the Mycenaeans rise up to become the dominant power in their section of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Aegean Sea when um, the Mycenaeans conquer Crete and thereby end the Minoan civilization, which had been fatally weakened. And that era lasts for about 200 years, and this is when the Mycenaeans are at their greatest power. They have pretty uh, far-reaching trade networks that they build on their own and inherit from the Minoans. And then we have the phase that I have labeled the decline and disappearance, which lasts for about 150 years. We see that they had a fairly big crisis in about 1250, but they recovered. And then around 1100, they had another grave crisis, and the sort of um, characteristic methods of building and government completely disappeared after 1100. The people who had composed the Mycenaean civilization, however, the Greek people, remained behind, and then they eventually rose up again, but with very very limited information about their own past um, to the point where they didn't really even know that the buildings that they could find had been built by their own ancestors. So we will uh, take a look at all that in due time. So the major sites for Mycenaean civilization, well the biggest one is at Mycenae itself which should come as no surprise really. Um, this was near the later city of Argos, and it seems to have been the most powerful of all of the city-states at this time. Um, in the, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, the king of Mycenae is the sort of high king of the Greeks. At Pylos, um, there's another major center. This was much smaller in classical antiquity, but it still had the tradition of being the home of Nestor, one of the great heroes in the Iliad, a man who was way past his prime but was known for his wisdom. And we found one of the best uh, preserved palaces there. Um, and there have been some fairly fanciful reconstructions of what this palace would have looked like in its prime. There is a small Mycenaean center at Tiryns. Um, it's not on the same scale as Mycenae or Pylos, but it's pretty well preserved. We also know that there was a Mycenaean presence at Athens on the Acropolis. And some of that has been obscured by the fact that the Athenians built heavily on the Acropolis in the classical period, things like the Parthenon and other buildings that are still there. But they have seen evidence of a Mycenaean uh, palace having been there before. Uh, Miletus was settled by the Mycenaeans after they took over Crete, so it was one of their later settlements. Um, and it does provide some evidence that the Mycenaeans engaged in colonization and invasions, which I guess in some ways makes the Trojan War story a little more plausible if we think that the Mycenaeans are the aggressors in that conflict. Another major center was the city of Knossos. Now the Minoans had of course built Knossos, but it was taken over by the Mycenaeans and then Mycenaean rulers at Knossos uh, went on to rule it for a few hundred more years, carrying on some of the Minoan traditions but also importing their own native traditions as well. And the region of Thessaly, which isn't really highlighted here at all, which is sort of in northern Greece, south of Macedonia, but north of, say, Athens and Thebes and all of that. Um, this area would also have a Mycenaean presence, but it would develop a little later and would always be on a smaller scale, probably because um, the Mycenaean civilization and its wealth seems to have been based on producing a surplus of olive oil and the farther north you go in the Balkans the less hospitable it is for oil production. Um, also Thessaly in the classical period was very unambiguously Greek um, and so it was due to this period when um, the Mycenaeans were spreading to the north. So anyway these are where we can find the most Mycenaean stuff. The general consensus about the way that governments during the Bronze Age in general and in Mycenaean Greece in particular worked is that they were palace states. Now this is basically just a sort of schematic model that scholars have developed whereby um, resources will be gathered at the palace and then redistributed by the king and his officials. So the king 
will be in charge of it all, but he'll have officials who are at the palace and who keep records, and that's where we get all our Linear B tablets. In addition, the king would also have local governors and inspectors who would go around and make sure that people in areas he controlled were doing what they were supposed to do. Um, the theory of the palace state is that most political and economic activity revolved around the palace, that um, you know, it was sort of like a small-scale command economy, sort of like the Soviet Union, but on a much, much smaller scale, and most likely without a lot of direct control, um, because just of the limitations of um, you know, the, the state at that time due to the lack of wealth and technology compared to other later ages. We also know that these palaces, to sustain themselves, would have had to control a fairly significant uh, chunk of countryside, so we know that um, they must have been bringing in tax revenue and kind from the surrounding countryside. And for Mycenaean Greece, this model seems to fit pretty well. Um, it doesn't necessarily fit the Minoans all that tightly, but it fits the Hittites and the Mycenaeans pretty well. And that's largely why this model was developed, because they looked at civilizations like the Mycenaeans and uh, figured out how it kind of worked, and then they saw that there are some parallels with how governments in the Near East worked. So there you go. That's how a political model can be formulated. The Linear B tablets that we found also reveal quite a bit about the political organization of Mycenaean society. We know from these that the Mycenaean cities were kingdoms which had a palace bureaucracy. At the head of this palace bureaucracy was the king, called the Wanox. The word Wanox died out by the time that um, classical Greeks began recording their language in great quantities, so the discovery of this word came as somewhat of a surprise to um, scholars who were trained in classical Greek. Um, the second in command to the king was called the Loagitis, which means the leader of the people, and he was someone who would have had about one-third the estate of the king. You can think of him as being something like a um, crown prince or something of that nature. Um, the most important uh, and best attested class in Mycenaean Greece were called the Hakitai. These are followers. Basically, these are just aristocrats who have their own estate, slaves, and chariots. They're really not all that different from the aristocrats of any other civilization in the ancient world, so far as we can tell. Um, and they would have been the people largely responsible for holding estates out in the countryside and then reporting in to uh, the king when he would call up an army to go wage war on one of his neighbors or something of that effect. And we also have a title, Basileus. And this caused a lot of confusion for scholars of Mycenaean Greece because it was clear from the context that the Basileus was a fairly lowly palace official in the Linear B tablets. And by the time we get to Homer, and from Homer on through the Byzantine Empire, which as you'll remember also used Greek, the term Basileus meant king or emperor. So, at some point during the Dark Ages, this term really changed its meaning pretty dramatically. Um, but in the Bronze Age itself, Basileus was not a high-ranking official by any stretch of the imagination. One of the most debated questions when it comes to the Mycenaeans is whether or not there was political unity among the Mycenaeans as a whole. Um, the idea that there was unity comes from the fact that in Homer, King Agamemnon of Mycenae was noted as sort of like the high king of all of the Achaeans. But um, the physical evidence seems to militate against such a conclusion. We don't have any tablets or seals or anything like that which would indicate that the uh, Wanox at Mycenae was issuing orders to the various kings and other places. And without that evidence, it seems very unlikely that there was political unity. Um, maybe there was some sort of confederation or some sort of loose alliance, but there certainly was no kind of, um, say, federal state or um, any kind of clear hegemony that Mycenae enjoyed over its neighbors. Um, also, in general, Greek geography tends to work against unity. If we look at the classical period and even into the Hellenistic period, uh, 
it was pretty rare for a power to be able to unify all of Greece. There's a lot of rugged terrain there. There's some internal uh, cultural differences, at least by the classical period, which emerge. Um, and it's also hard to really build up the logistical um, infrastructure that you would need to sustain garrisons all over Greece if there were different parts of it that were willing and able to revolt. So anyway, I think those are reasonable considerations that you have to keep in mind. And I sort of feel like unity is probably a Homeric fiction. Um, I don't really think that it would be possible for all of the various kings of the Mycenaeans to have raised an army and gone to Troy under the general leadership of Agamemnon. Now, I do think that there were uh, Mycenaean adventurers and, say, princes who weren't going to inherit, and maybe they got together and formed an expedition and went to places like Troy. Um, we also think that's how the Mycenaeans probably came to power in Crete, for instance. But in terms of there being a permanent political unity, I just don't see it, and I think that the evidence largely works against such a conclusion. Let's talk about architecture briefly. Um, so we don't have any fully intact Mycenaean palaces, and most of the frescoes and wall and ceiling decorations are long since destroyed. However, based on what we have been able to find of the remnants of buildings, this is one reconstruction of what the palace at Pylos, the so-called Palace of Nestor, might have looked like in its prime. And you can see here that this is a pretty elaborate structure. Um, it has some beautiful frescoes, it has very ornate ceilings and floors, and it also has an upper level that you can see there. It features columns. Um, and it also kind of looks like the final stage of Golden Axe 2 for Sega Genesis when you uh, play the boss who I believe is named Dark Gould, but that's a, diver that's a um, pretty big tangent. Anyway, um, this is hard to test, but I think that it should be food for thought. This is something that um, if they were able to build on this scale, it's fairly amazing that the civilization sprang up so quickly and then was able to achieve something this dramatic. Um, over a fairly short period of time, especially when we look at the slow rate of change when we look into the distant past. When we get to about 1250 or so, as I mentioned, there was sort of a wave of destruction across Greece. We see that there was a burn layer, and then the cities were all rebuilt. And when they were rebuilt, most of them were fortified, and that led to what are usually called the Cyclopean walls going up. Um, they're called Cyclopean because these blocks are huge and they're much bigger than what the later Greeks used. Um, these were built for city walls around the various sites at Mycenae. This is the first time that all of the Mycenaean sites were fully uh, fortified. And also a lot of these fortifications would encompass a cistern or well, so that way there would be a, a water source that any besieged power would have access to without having to leave its own fortifications. Um, because of the size of these blocks and because a lot of the Greeks uh, who had mostly moved their blocks by hand in the classical period, again the blocks were much smaller, they envisioned that whoever moved these blocks must have been much stronger. So this led them to a couple conclusions. One, people in the past were simply stronger because they had more god genetics in them. And two, uh, it's possible that these things were built by the Cyclopses because uh, they were big and strong. They could have moved this stuff. So that name kind of stuck. These are called Cyclopean walls. And these are characteristic of uh, Mycenaean palaces and fortifications. But most of them didn't really originate until pretty late in the Mycenaean civilization around 1250. So they were only really in use for about 150 years. Um, and this is the Lion's Gate at Mycenae. This is probably the most famous um, single piece of architecture at the site of Mycenae. Um, we see there that it's kind of an entrance. You have this great gate. It's sort of a narrow opening, but with an imposing wall and then this symbol of the two lions, which may have symbolized, say, the royal house there at Mycenae. Anyway... Uh, that's enough about architecture for now. Here is another view from the ruins of Mycenae looking out at the mountains. 
possibly one of the reasons why the site of Mycenae was settled in the first place is because it's more or less ringed by hilly country. So attacking this area, especially once you put in the Cyclopean fortifications, would be a rather difficult proposition. Um, this site was later visited, as I said earlier, it was near classical Argos, um, but no one at the time really realized the full significance of this site. One of the major differences between the Minoans and Mycenaeans is that where most Minoan art is happy, cheerful, and civilian in nature, Mycenaean art is full of depictions of warfare, and Mycenaean graves are full of armor and weapons. So, because of that, we generally assume that warfare was central to Mycenaean culture. As you might imagine, the fact that we normally think of Homer as representing an echo of the Mycenaean Age and the Iliad and Odyssey are all about killing and being killed adds to that impression quite a bit. When we look at a lot of the vase paintings and frescoes that we can find from the Mycenaean period, we also see yet more depictions of warfare. This little uh, painting here was from a vase we see that there are heavily armed Mycenaean troops marching in lockstep. Um, we also can probably guess, based on um, other ancient societies, that there was a strong link between one's social rank and their role in war. Um, we see some echoes of that in the Iliad and Odyssey, especially the Iliad, where um, you know the really rich, important guys who are either kings or the sons of kings are the greatest warriors and people who have no real possessions like Thersites, who I named this channel after, uh, tend to not have a very high esteem when it comes to their ability to make war. So anyway, um, and again, this relies a lot on Homer, but we're dealing with a fairly limited amount of information, so we have to make do with what we sort of have at our disposal. Let's look in detail at the Mycenaean conquest of Crete and how they brought an end to the Minoan civilization. So, as I mentioned in my Minoan video, sort of the pivotal event in Minoan history is when the volcano erupted at Thera, which destroyed one of the largest Minoan settlements at Santorini, and then caused a tsunami which ravaged the north coast of Crete, where most of the Minoan cities were. Um, there was rebuilding on the part of the Minoans, but they don't seem to have reacquired the same level of power and prosperity, and that then led to their conquest at the hands of the Mycenaeans from about 1450 on. Uh, most likely what happened, as I mentioned earlier, is that this conquest was not done by any single um, state of the Mycenaeans, but rather it was done by Mycenaean adventurers who banded together and did this as a group. Um, we do find Linear B tablets from this time forward. We actually find a few from before this time, which could just be an indication of trade. But now Linear B becomes the dominant form of um, language and record keeping. And we also see that the art style in places like Kenosis changes fairly dramatically. Uh, it becomes much more militarized. We see that vases and frescoes take on a much more Mycenaean militaristic character and that old Minoan themes fade out pretty quickly. One other piece of evidence that we have is that the Mycenaeans were very impressed by Minoan stone cutting. Uh, the Minoans had, you know, cut into stones directly to do their carvings, and then we see uh, shortly after this period that Minoan stone cutting appears in Greece. And uh, we think that what happened is the Mycenaeans sent some Minoan stone cutters to Greece as slaves, and then they passed on their talents to future generations and that this became an element of uh, Mycenaean culture thereafter. Because of the Mycenaean conquest and settlement, uh, conquerors usually tend to make the people they conquer adhere to their own language and their own culture, especially in the distant past when it's harder to keep records and really preserve a culture in a conscious way, or conscience way, conscious way, there we go, yeah, that. Um, so what happens is that the inhabitants of Crete will go on to basically forget about the Minoan past. Um, during the classical period, there is never any indication that the civilization that was produced that was on Crete was anything other than Greek, or that King Minos was anything other than Greek. And because we know that the Mycenaeans were also seafarers, 
um, and that um, you know Kenosis was a major Mycenaean center once it was conquered. There's also a possibility that the story of King Minos uh, actually is a dimly remembered Mycenaean ruler rather than a dimly remembered Minoan ruler, and that he was launching raids from Kenosis at the expense of other Mycenaean sites. And that may explain the story of the labyrinth that the Athenians had where you know King Minos demanded tribute from Athens and that um, you know young men and women were sacrificed in the labyrinth to a monster called the Minotaur. But anyway, those are just some thoughts. So let's consider the role that the Mycenaeans played in international trade. We know that the Mycenaeans imported foreign goods like gold, glass, copper, and ivory. Like Crete, they were fairly uh, poor when it came to precious metals and a lot of luxury goods. Uh, we also know that the Mycenaeans sent out pottery, which probably contained olive oil, which has always been a major export of the Greek world, and that we find this, polis, uh, this pottery in places like Egypt, the Levant, Cyprus, and even as far afield as Sicily and South Italy. Um, and because of this trade contact, we have writings by the New Kingdom Egyptians regarding the Mycenaeans, and it seems that they regard the Mycenaeans as being under a single ruler. Um, some people have taken that as evidence that there was a unified Mycenaean uh, state as, um, that included all Mycenaeans. However, my thought would be that it's more likely that this was just a recognition of the Egyptians of the Mycenaeans who had conquered Crete in particular and had taken up some of the old trade networks um, between Crete and Italy, and that this was just a way for the um, Egyptians to sort of validate this takeover and restore trade relations um, between Crete and Egypt. But I don't know. Um, again, when we look at a lot of this stuff, we're forced to speculate, and it's more or less impossible to fully prove or disprove any idea when it comes to uh, studying the Mycenaeans. When it comes to any discussion of Mycenaean Greece, a discussion of the Trojan War is completely unavoidable due to the fact that Homer is so well known and his story has been adapted so many times, as it was in 2004 when the Brad Pitt movie Troy was made. Um, this is basically just a really pared down version of the Iliad, which excluded the gods and a lot of other elements which made the Iliad what it was. But I will say that Brad Pitt did a great job of portraying Achilles because he comes off as a narcissistic douche, and that is exactly kind of what Achilles was, so uh, props to Brad Pitt. The fundamental question that I want to pose, but that I will not answer with any certainty, is whether the Trojan War was fact or fiction. Did this great expedition of the Achaeans to Troy happen? Um, we've already established that Heinrich Schliemann more or less proved that his Sarlik is the same as Troy, which in the ancient world was generally called Ilion. Um, so when we talk about any of those three names, we're talking about the same place. Um, the existence of Troy is also sort of attested in Hittite text, and the Hittites also mention uh, Mycenaean aggression in this general region of the western coast of Asia Minor. If this event is historical, then it would have occurred anywhere between about 1260 and 1180 or so BCE. Um, one interesting fact about this, if it is true, is that it would have represented a major undertaking on the part of the Mycenaeans, but then been followed in very short order, only a generation or two, by the complete destruction of the entire civilization itself. Um, one thing that I think we can rule out with a fair degree of certainty, and by fair I mean complete, degree of certainty is that there's no way that a Bronze Age army could endure a 10-year siege that far away from their home base. Remember, the Greeks are on the other side of the Aegean. That's where their power source is. There's really no way that they could have camped out near Troy, especially right on the shore, and managed to keep themselves supplied for 10 years. Um, and, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of odd details in Homer which suggest that the story was amended many times over the course of the Dark Ages and the early Archaic period before 
it was finally written down and took a concrete form. Um, so it looks like this story may have just been um, a kind of conglomeration of various oddly, uh, dimly remembered um, raiding expeditions that famous Mycenaeans had undertaken, but maybe the names of the characters are more or less fictionalized. So it could be sort of a historical medley comparable to the story of King Arthur, which most people think was based on some really vaguely remembered things done by multiple people, and then those events were then attributed to a single person, and he was given a much stronger Roman identity than he may have actually had. Anyway, um, those are sort of my thoughts on whether the Trojan War was fact or fiction. My answer, more or less, is maybe in a way, but not really. So let's revisit the issue of the decline and fall of the Mycenaean civilization. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's a wave of destruction across the Greek world in 1250, followed by rebuilding and fortification. We also know that the Mycenaeans were still active abroad, as Hittite records show the Ahayawa still active on the international scene around the year 1200. So we know this wasn't a permanent setback for the Mycenaeans, what happened in 1250, that is. Uh, however, then we see another wave of destruction and depopulation spread across the Mycenaean world starting in 1180. The city of Pylos is burned, and some of the tablets that um, had not been fully fired for preservation ended up being accidentally fired when the city was burned. Um, and these tablets mention defensive preparations that were being made to stave off an attack, but we don't get any real details on who these attackers actually were. Um, and when the Mycenaean civilization collapsed, it seems to have collapsed sort of from the west to the east to some extent, um, this complete collapse is where we get the term Bronze Age collapse. Um, if we look at most of the other civilizations of the Bronze Age, they declined, but they didn't necessarily fall. Um, Assyria and Babylon, Egypt, and the Hittites even, these civilizations remained around. They just declined and shrank, but they did not disappear. So therefore they did not collapse. It was only the civilization in Greece that we now call the Mycenaeans which collapsed. So when you see the term Bronze Age collapse, just keep in mind that, that this is seen from a very Hellenocentric viewpoint. Um, and it was labeled this way by, say, British and American scholars because when they look at the Bronze Age and they have to identify a we to relate to, they naturally gravitate towards the Greeks. Um, this leads, of course, to the Greek Dark Ages from about 1100 to 800, and, um, that, and during the course of that period we'll have the Homeric epics take form, and we also see that the Greeks sort of more or less completely forget about Mycenaean civilization, and that at the end of the Dark Ages they're unaware of there having been a discontinuity in their past. They remember the age of mythology as being historical, and then they think that they are a direct continuation of that, uh, a slow progression from that point without any major bumps in the road. So let's talk about a couple of other side issues before we call it quits today. Um, one source of speculation about the Mycenaeans is their relationship to the famous Sea Peoples of the Bronze Age Collapse era. Um, so, there's some speculation as to whether the Mycenaeans might have been victims of the Sea Peoples, or whether they themselves actually were the Sea Peoples, or even a part of the Sea Peoples, since there are some scholars who say that the Sea Peoples were not a single ethnic group, but were rather just a group of ravagers who were responding to harsh economic times by forming into massive bands of pirates and going on plundering raids. At any rate, um, it's hard to say, but one piece of evidence has emerged that there were pig remains at a uh, Sea People site, and that we can tell that these pigs must have come from mainland Greece. Some scholars have interpreted that to mean that the Mycenaeans were indeed at least a part of the Sea Peoples. Others have said that all it proves is that they raided Greece and took away pigs. Um, it's hard to really say. There's not really much we can do with that specific fact. But the, the possibility certainly does remain that the Mycenaeans were in some way involved uh, with the Sea People, either as victims or as participants, or maybe as both, depending on which uh, 
Greek area you're talking about. Um, anyway, there's also a tradition somewhere in the Middle East, I believe in the uh, area of Judea, where there was one group which claimed to have an ancestral kinship with the Spartans, and the Spartans claimed, or maybe it was the Spartans who held the claim of ancestral kinship with the people there. And if the Mycenaeans did indeed, or at least some of them went and settled in the Near East as Sea Peoples, then maybe that would explain the source of that particular tradition. But anyway, um, this is largely speculative, and we currently don't have enough data to really say much. After all, as I said, pigs can be taken as plunder, and it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, people joined you and brought their pigs with them. The last thing that I want to talk about is the tradition of Athenian autochthony and how this tradition could very well have emerged from the fall of Mycenaean civilization. So all of the Mycenaean palaces in Greece, with one exception, were burned to the ground, presumably by a hostile invader. And the one exception was the Mycenaean palace at Athens. Eventually it fell into disuse and was then built over by later Athenians. Um, however, they did preserve a tradition that they were the only Greeks who had never been conquered and who had never migrated from elsewhere. They said that they literally sprang up from the earth, which is what autochthonous means. Um, so, it's possible that this is a dimly remembered um, event, that this claim to autochthony is a dimly remembered memory of the Mycenaean Age. Just like the story of Theseus slaying the Minotaur seems to have some kind of resonance with either the very deep past Athenians defeating the Minoans or the Mycenaeans who were stationed in Crete and may have tried to impose their will upon Mycenaean Athens. That being said, Mycenaean Athens was a fairly minor player in the Bronze Age and it was by no means one of the bigger or stronger powers. Um, and the palace at Athens was fairly modest in size. So if this is indeed the source of these Athenian traditions, then it must be said that the relatively minor Mycenaean state at Athens ended up having an outsized impact on the later thought of the Athenians. Anyway, that's all I have for the Mycenaeans. Um, hopefully this was useful to you in some way in establishing who the Mycenaeans are and giving you some general ideas about the impact that their civilization had.